This Tibet House video was originally recorded at Menlo Retreat in Phoenicia, New York, March 2017. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menlo.us. Uh, I went there twice. Uh, was it twice or three times? Twice. I think I went there twice. And um, it's an amazing place, very high, about 18,000, 19,000 feet. And uh, if you go there and make a prayer to the goddess, then you can see the future. And that's where they go to, to discover the reincarnations of the Dalai Lama. And then one of the times I was there happened to be the time the Chinese were coming with the Lama from Tashilubo to find the Penjin Lama. And um, the, the Secret Service, Chinese Secret Service people with that Lama were very annoyed to see a Western group there in tents, but they couldn't kick us out. And uh, the Lama sneaked over in the pre dawn moments and scratched on my tent and sneaked into my tent and, thought, and told, sent me messages to the Lama about the Pentagon. Oh. Uh, how he would uh, keep the Dalai Lama in the loop mm. and how he wouldn't tell the Chinese, you know, this and that, and uh, he was making all kinds of, and then he sneaked out before the dawn. Oh. Uh, I was surprised. You know. I didn't know that, I mean, it wasn't planned, it just happened by oh, wow. accident. And um, people see visions, she showed the vision that uh, I think they recognize the Dalai Lama. So the Buddhists, you know, the thing is the Buddhists are a little bit complacent, you know, because they do feel this connection with the Great Mother. You know, if you feel a connection with the Great Mother, if you, it's really hard, it's hard to imagine, but we Westerners are definitely brought up that, that life is bad and that, you know, we have to be guarded against life because, you know, for thousands of years the church was sending everybody to hell, you know, about whatever natural feelings they have, there's something sinful and horrible about them. And then the, the materialists simply intervened and said, you don't have to worry about it because you're going to be nothing because you don't have a soul and you don't have a mind. But, in a, and so people desperately cling to that. Like my grandfather, I started doing Buddhism when he was around 90. And he was a hardcore materialist. And, um, and um, he started debating me when I discovered that the, when I was intuitively felt that there was a continuity of lives. And it became, became, began to become sort of commonsensical to me. Began to it. I think it takes 10 decades or two to really shift the conditioning that we have about how we expect this life to be the only thing that is us. This body, you know, we're the body, you know. So it's very, very hard for us to, and this body, you know, is just lots of germs internally, there's like, Hazards externally, there's terrorists, there's robbers, murderers, muggers, <laughs> what have you, abusive relatives, you know. There's all these terrible things. So to sort of turn that around and decide that we are floating in the Great Mother, you know, Nirvana, that, that everything is just fine and any, any suffering and any problem has to do with our maladjustment. The mental maladjustment to ignorance and to delusively clinging to some worldview that isn't really the case, and uh, physical maladjustment you know, or other ways, you know, based on but based on that core wiring thing of the maladjustment of thinking that we are something more important than the rest of it, and the rest of it is kind of against us, and that's what we that's that's what our culture has indoctrinated us in, and at very powerful levels even we think we have a belief in some other thing, we're still kind of geared that way, you know, frightened of everything. You know. That is the thing. And, um, you know, somehow, I think India puzzled people when, when the Westerners started discovering India culturally. And, of course, China also to a lesser extent, but India and other Asian countries. But all those countries that had been strongly touched by Buddhism, which is not a religion, not, not only as a religion, let's say, but as a different worldview, a different science, a different reality view. 
uh, people were less violent, more gentle, they were less mobilized. The Muslims who had conquered India centuries before the Europeans arrived had become less militant by living there, you know, by being indoctrinated or sort of acculturated with the Indian abundance and the Indian kind of uh, uh, relaxed, you know, you know, inner energy, openness to energy. And, uh, you know, they were making Taj Mahals and things, you know, et cetera, and leaving there. When they arrived, they were, they were not caring so much about their women then. But they learned to, in India, or they kept their thing. So, you know, I long for the day when history is taught in such a way that the, the victors in the great colonial conquest of the planet are seen as the less civilized. And the uh, people who were conquered are seen as the more civilized. Civilized, otherwise, the Brits thought civilized men, you know, stiff upper lip and shoot people who don't pay taxes to you, put them in debt or prison or whatever. Uh, genocide them. And uh, that's the lesser people who behave like that. I think. So, so, one of the main things, I think, one of the main jobs at Menla that we feel is to of the mission of Menla, because it's kind of trying to be a little outpost of Tibetan culture. <clears throat> Tibet is an extraordinary country that had a huge conquest empire 13, 1400 years ago. You know, they were, the Chinese were scared of them, the Nepalese were scared of them, the Muslims who were scared of them, they defeated Harun al-Rashid's armies in Western Tibet and in, in, in Northern Pakistan and some of the problems about that area. They, um, they were very ferocious and rough, you know, coming from that tremendous high altitude with that nitric oxide chemistry that they have, you know, that's been the body has extreme the durability, you know, strength, you know. And, uh, and in about a thousand years, they officially more or less demilitarized, where there was no budget for military, more or less. And there was, uh, it was not considered a good occupation, and that kind of a sort of a ambitious male person. And the females were not doing military in those days much, but very rarely. But the ambitious male who normally would have made their rise in society through becoming some kind of warrior, they became monks, and they they developed this peace culture basically. Even though there was some rough stuff in it, and some of the monks were rough actually, too rough. You know. But um, they had the toughy, what I call the toughy monks, the doptos. But still, it's an extraordinary civilization achievement over, over that period of many centuries to change the culture from where you don't really admire the violent warrior anymore. And you admire the self-controlled person seeking self-control, self-transcendence, you know, self-conquest rather than other conquest. And um, I think the Indians, it's less clear because of the waves of people who invaded India, but I think large parts of India also achieved that before they were conquered by the Muslim invasions. And then the Mongolians sort of imitated the Tibetan one, and the Tibetans sort of foisted that same cultural shift on them in a, in a quicker time, about four or five hundred years, from the Mongolian, ferocious Mongolian Empire to a non-violent, demilitarized society that was easily beaten up by Russians and Chinese in the 20th century, because it didn't really have a war culture. You know. So it's really, you know, we're taught in our schools, for example, that every culture and country has always fought. And if you were demilitarized or if you were let your defenses down, you'd be invaded and taken over by a neighbor. We're almost taught that. And in a way, the Buddhist countries the ones that were really heavily Buddhist, not just sort of partially Buddhist, but really when mainstream Buddhists, which were really India, Tibet, and Mongolia, were really the only three. The East Asian countries always maintained a big role, and the Southeast Asian countries for the king and the army. They never really completely demilitarized, so they, Buddhism was there was like countercultural, like Christianity was in the Western countries, because the military remains the main thing still, the biggest and strongest institution the kingship and the military in the country. And um, 
In India, at Buddha's time, it was like a kingship of military. And he created a new model uh, for that. You know? and, and, and actually, modern, like Sri Aurobindo, mm -hmm. some of modern Indian um, mystics and great spiritual leaders who also knew something about history and also were part of the wish to be liberated from the British colonial thing and so on. But they blamed the Buddhists for creating this too much asceticism and making their country militarily weak over many centuries to then be conquered by first Muslims and then Europeans. And they all been doing. Buddha is not popular in Oroville, as I found. There are a lot of people there who are like, oh no, the Buddha. Buddhists were too much, too much asceticism, too pacific, then we got conquered by the Europeans. And the, the, the Neo-Confucians feel that, actually, in China, to a certain extent, you know. Because Buddhism puts into question the sort of native thing, actually, always. It's, um, I like to say, the Buddhist monastery is the first domestic abuse intervening institution in history. Mm -hmm. Especially the female monasticism, which Buddha was reluctant to do because he knew it would stress, it would stress out the tolerance of the male authorities in the society because there would be such a rush by the women to get out of the extended male patriarchal family system, which it was. You know, they weren't really dying to have babies starting at 12, you know, and maybe 10, 12 childbirths, half of them surviving by 20 or 25, and being pretty wrecked by that. You know, that was that was the female role, you know, and besides work and cook and plant and weed and harvest and whatever. And uh, so, he, but, but, but he did create the female monasticism, and there was a huge rush, as he predicted, there would be, and the, and the Brahmins didn't tolerate it for too many centuries. Because, you know, they wanted to marry off their daughters and women with their slaves. They didn't want them all to become enlightened. And, uh, and uh, begging lunch instead of having to cook it. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to make that point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to digress too much into history, but I want to make the point that you know, if you, the more you can slowly shift your reality sense and decide that whatever happens, the more open you are, whatever, live or die. Everything is fine. You know, the more close you are, the more stress, the more difficult, the more harm, the more struggle it will be. And uh, it's very hard to shift that around. And we're definitely, you know, trained to be guarded and defended. You know? and, uh, and of course, practically, there's some degree of guarding and defending it naturally. Nobody's saying go out and step in front of a tank or something right away. But uh, that, the, that the rule of thumb is like that. That the underlying thing, if all else fails and you have to go, then it'll be all right if you can just give. Give it up, you know. As they say, give it up. That's really hard to make that shift. But that's a really key thing to do. You know, I, I, my slogan. In the Why the Dalai Lama Matters book, I was challenged by a wonderful publisher, of Simon and Schuster, an Australian woman. I can't remember her name, but she said, okay, at the end of this book, you have to write for me one appendix. I said, okay, sure, what is that? And I was ready to do anything because she's, she overruled various people who were worried, editors, and she put the red flag on the cover. You know, Simon and Schuster editor. Uh, Lady, uh, the publisher, the top boss, you know. And, uh, so I was with, and she said, you have to write down 10 points of hope, you know, about the Tibet-China thing and about the world or something like that. So I did that. There's a little appendix you can see in that book. But the last statement in the book is, so our duty in fighting against the bad guys and the blue meanies, as the Beatles called them, is to be happy. And the challenge is to be so happy that even if they kill us, we'll die happy. <laughs> and I thought that why, and I don't know why. I, was, I then used it a lot in my talks. Because sometimes, especially during certain kinds of time when people were thinking this and that was going wrong and there was terrorism and whatever it is, 
since you know we, our country was hijacked 15 years ago, 16, 17 years ago, by the military-industrial complex. Then uh, you know I like that line because you know when I generally give a hopeful, upbeat, you know sort of Dalai Lama-esque vision of the world. Sometimes people feel inspired and they want to make a like a standing ovation, you know, which I find a little embarrassing and awkward. So when I use that line, they sort of really, they start to jump up. Even if they kill, they'll die happy. <laughs> they go like, oh, <laughs> they kind of calm them down. And they're like, yeah, I got a little bit. So I, I'm, I'm happy with that. I enjoy that one. I mean, not that I'm capable of, of succumbing so easily myself, whatever happens. I don't pretend to be, you know, reach that point. Really, but uh, uh, I can see the principle, that's what I'm trying to convey. So that what I'm trying to share with you is that you should try to imagine that you're experimenting, you're in, you're in a life of learning, and the aim of your life is to learn how to be happier, and it's in a background of a situation that at its fundamental level is happiness. Somehow you are made of happiness, you're made of relief, you're made of bliss, you're made of health. That's what you're made of. And anything, any feeling that you have that you don't have that, is something you can unravel internally in yourself, ultimately. Either in this life or another life, you know. And, and, it, and so everything's going for you, so to speak. You know? Like health itself, for example. I think that you know, I think the health, your one cell and one molecule or one whatever it is in your body likes the next one. So it's sort of ready to be open to connecting, you know, like the different cells and molecules in the fingers and the thumb, they are in the hand, you know, that's ready to connect to the other one. So they enjoy being connected to each other. So that openness and the, the cheerfulness and openness of the of the substances even that our that our body is made of is uh, is our health, and uh, when we put into it, when we put into it an attitude that, that there's something wrong with us, it's like when you know they, you know Deepak Chopra has one of the things where he says some they did some studies and when people go into have like a HIV thing, when they hear that they have it, even whether it's true or not. Even if it was a mistake, or for some reason, part of the study, I think they were doing, their T cell count drops instantly <laughs> by a huge percentage. Just thinking that they are like ill, you know. So the mind is so powerful in in uh, in in that. So anyway, so that's the thing. That's our job. Trying to figure out that everything is okay. <laughs> and one of the one of the really good. What? One of the helpful ways to do that is to align with... Yes, that's a great moment, right? Right. It's like that C.K., Louis C.K., you know, the comedian? Did you ever see his little thing before the election? No. no. If only it had been done like six months earlier and was everywhere and everybody. He gave this thing about how he finally realized he was going to definitely vote for Hillary and everyone should. It was on one of those late night talk shows, I forget which one. And uh, he said... Why, he said. He said, because Hillary is a mom, he said. And moms, you know, they know how to take abuse. <laughs> he said. And after all, that's what you want a president is for. You want to complain it's the president's fault. And it's not like it's really horrible and the president's terrible. He said she's used to it. One thing Hillary Clinton has learned to do is to take abuse. <laughs> he went on and on with that. And he said the other one. You say a tiny little criticism of him, everything stops until he can go and get you. And like, besides, he said, even a good dad, he said, is still only 40% of what a good mom is. And he went on and on with it in a way. And his final punchline was, if you vote for Hillary, you're smart. If you vote for Trump, you're, you're, you're being con or you're a fool or something. You know, you're going to be deceived. And if you don't put it all, you're an asshole. <laughs> Behave these three things. But it was really brilliant. It was about four, four or five minutes. 
and it's worth looking up on YouTube. Louis C.K. On, on one of those shows, like the late night ones, you know. Maybe it, well, maybe it was the one who used to be, what's his name? Conan. Yeah, I think it was Conan. And Conan was, that was helping him on, and leading him on, you know, very nicely. Really good. Sorry. But he, but he said about So the idea that the Western thing is like, the supreme power is a male god, is a dad, you see, not a mom. Yeah. Right? So the shift, the idea that the supreme power, the reality, is a mom, is really more relaxing. <laughs> well, for some people. <laughs> what? For some. Well, for everybody but the mom. Yeah. But apparently that mom is able to take it. Apparently. <laughs> Great mom. So, Bob, we had a question over here earlier. Yes. Oh. What? Thank oh, you yeah. for sharing the story about Lago Lazzo. It's um, funny yes. that you mentioned visiting the lake because my question is about Pandel Lamo. Uh, yeah, Pandel Lamo? Yes. Um, we were going to talk about Tara and then I thought of her because I'm always confused by the story because she's very ferocious and she has her baby skulls sitting. She's sitting with the, uh, oh, yeah, the children the child and, her mouth. and the blood and, mm. you know, she's very ferocious. So I wondered if you could explain that goddess. Well, you know her story, you know her story, what it, what it was, sure. her uh, origin she's story one of, the queens. of uh, Sri Devi, at least from the Buddhist yes. side. Yes. The origin story is that she, as the incarnation of Tara, was the favorite queen of a South Indian king. Uh, who is who is unspecified, it's like a legend, but who engaged in human sacrifice. And he was a warrior king, and when he would conquer a neighboring king that he would sacrifice prisoners. It was one of his things. And um, at some point, some climactic point, uh, she was uh, given the honor of leading out some sacrificial victims as the, as the head queen, or the chief queen. And so what she did was she came out holding her two children by this king in her two hands, ah. you know, a boy and a girl. And um, so uh, he said, what's the matter with you? Are you insane? But those are my children. And she said, well, all of the beings that you sacrifice are your children. So you want me to bring out captives? So here, you sacrifice them. And then he said, first thing, he was angry and like, no, you know, arrest this woman, you know, he was going to like do her in, of course, as, as beautiful and as desirable as she was. And then, but then when they tried to sort of stop her, uh, the police or the soldiers, whoever, you know, the bodyguards, uh, she turned into Kali, Sri Devi, and she herself sacrificed the two children, right, in oh. front of them, tore them to bits, and twirled, put one of them in her mouth. And one of them, I think, she made a saddle thing on this mule. A uh, skin of one of them, yeah, and, and he had to watch this because he, you know, had a divine thing. And then he was like, "Okay, I'll stop. I'll never do it. Turn back into yourself. I get the message." You know? But she was too late, and she rode off into the sky. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and so it's a story like that. So in a way, it's interesting. It's like one way men have abused women in history is by threatening the children of the mother. And uh, that they'll do something to the children, you know, if the women don't do what they want. So that's, that's the weakness of the woman, is her attachment to the children. So she precisely, you know, she shows that she's not going to be deterred by that. And the idea as a divinity, of course, is that she created these children, but they, they are just her product. Like it's a common Indian theme. It might sound shocking to you, but it's a common Indian theme. For example, there's a wonderful former life story of the Buddhas, where he was a great sage in a certain kingdom. And there were six teachers who were agitating and didn't like him because he gave good advice to the king and the country was prosperous and it was fine. And there were six ministers who had other ideologies and they wanted to get rid of him politically and they badmouthed him. And eventually the king kind of suspected him and he left, you know, the kingdom. And then they, those ministers gave advice and the kingdom was going down the drain, you know. So then the, the guy returned this Mahabodhi, his name was, this, um, this uh, sage, he, just, he felt sorry for the people of the kingdom and the king, who had been a friend of his. So he created a magic monkey himself, and then he killed it and skinned it oh. 
but he had created it anyway. It was his magic. It was his uh, own ma 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 you know, magical act action. Was and then he went back wearing the skin of the monk, the fresh skin of the monk. And then the six ministers, when he came to the court, and he was welcomed at the court, you know, the, oh, he's visiting, you know, the great old guy who's seen my friend. And uh, then the ministers sort of were frightened to see him because they thought he might return into the good graces of the king. So they started attacking him for having killed the monkey, having come with the dead monkey skin. And then he refuted them one and all. One of them was a fatalist, one was a nihilist, one but they were different kinds of ideologies. But in all of their, he proved how all of their ideologies would make it where they wouldn't care at all about it, killing a monkey. And then he revived the monkey. And he said, this was just my creation, and I just created this as a show to draw you guys out and to show you, because my thing, my nature of thing, compassion, wisdom, you know, the, the Dharma teaching is, you just wouldn't kill a monkey to do this, you know. In fact, I do care about it for this being the reason that that monkey and me are one being. In other words, the teaching, like we've been talking, wisdom and compassion. So the fact that she killed those two children in front of him, which was you know the people that he did identify with and didn't want to sacrifice, but then she did that to let him see what it felt like, then cured him apparently. She needed he needed that tough medicine to stop human sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's the origin story of of, of, of that version of Kali, you know, who was the special protector of Kali. And when he came out as a, as a refugee, or escaping the Chinese in 1959, the Chinese mousetrap that had been set for him and the Tibetan, uh, he, uh, he, wore, he had a thing on his back that looked like maybe a gun, because he was, he was dressed as a soldier. But actually it was the rolled up special kanka he has of Ben Lama, which only the Dalai Lamas can see, nobody else sees it. Apparently she talks and gives advice and does different things. It's very active. I have a novel that I wrote with someone that, that we have to finish one of his days of the sixth dialogue. And the tanka is very much an actor, acts, sometimes talks and gets shakes, you know. It uh, intervenes in, in uh, the painting, the icon of Pindanon. So she's really great. She has a mild form where she's like a wealth goddess, like Lakshmi. You know, very mild and, and beautiful and holding jewels and vases and things like that. But uh, she can adopt that other form to get rid of bad guys. Bend it on. Any other, another question? Any question? Yes. Um, was, Erica. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was... I was wondering um, if you could um, offer sort of your interpretation from, you know, Shanti Deva, sort of like offering the victory. Um, offering what? Offering the victory. Oh, the victory. Oh, yeah. You mean you mean like what they call lojong in Tibet, mind transformation. We oh, yeah, have Shanti Deva is, the, is that one oh, that's in the patience chapter for Shanti Deva. But, it, but the Lojong is, grows out of that, and out of Nagarjuna and Shantideva's thing. But Lojong is a little more radical, almost, well, the same thing, actually. And uh, there the idea is, again, surprising. Again, it relates to what I was rambling on about at the beginning, actually. Where if you feel that the base reality is goodness, pure goodness, pure satisfaction, nirvana, which Buddha renounced immediately. Four Noble Truths means, of the Four Noble Truths, only one of them is actual reality. Three of them are superficial reality. They are kind of actual, but they're illusory. They're not a complete illusion, but they're illusory. So that means the cause of suffering, suffering and the cause of suffering, and the path to the freedom from suffering, first, second, and fourth, are superficial reality. The only ultimate reality, real reality, is nirvana, the third noble truth, that there's freedom from suffering. So Buddha did announce that. He never taught, really, dualistic, a dualistic idea that there's, a, there's an escape zone outside the world where you can go and be free of suffering. He, from, but he didn't, he let them think there would be something like that to some extent, because some hard case people who are very alienated 
and are very invested in their sort of inner space that's separate from everything else. The inner absolute is them. You know, the idea that that inner absolute will be fully realized in an experience of nirvana or vast space or whatever different images or oneness with the deity, with, a, with an absolute deity that is disconnected from the world, you know. Um, as mystics get into that. Uh, they're not going to so let them think that they're achieving that in, in order to become more peaceful and better in the world. And then ultimately, of course, they discover that it doesn't last and there is no such place. The absolute cannot be a place that is not the relative or it's a relative. Right? Because there's a boundary between it and the relative. So there's no such thing you know, in that sense. That's what emptiness means. The absolute is emptiness, which means the nature of the relative. The place where the relative happens, if you follow. It's that radical non duality. So, uh, so then, if you know that, and you know it even just intellectually, it makes more sense to you, conceptually, in other words. And viscerally, you still don't really feel that, because, of course, viscerally, you're still too scared to really be just completely open, just let it all go, just float downstream, whatever it is. And because uh, you feel like you get hurt, you know, something will damage you, you know. The world is threatening and difficult, you know. And um, so, but, it would, but if you have some level of grasping of that, even if it goes against maybe your habitual inclination of self-centeredness, which is a wiring thing. It isn't like some moralistic self-centeredness. It's just that's the way you see things. We see things. We are like you see things like that. We are at the center of it. And uh, then, however, I know that I'm wrong to be thinking that. So then, when I when someone wants to make a conflict with me, and I'm about to go ballistic and get, get, give, over, give myself over so that my body and mind complex becomes a tool of rage, anger, hostility, aggression, harmfulness, violence, uh, then um, that knowledge, you know, that the world is fine if you're open and you're not closing yourself, and the biggest closing and putting a boundary between self and others is when you or give yourself over to hate. You're taken over by hate, fury, anger, all those emotions. Then you have a motive to restrain that anger, to not let it arise, to diffuse it in some other way. And that's why then when the enemy comes at you, you say, okay, you win. You, you can, you know, rather than rather than fight you, rather than you yourself are a helpless person driven by your own jealousy and anger and hatred, etc. Those addictions, addictive mental, mental addictions that force you to close yourself off and be harmful to others and now you want to be harmful to me. But one thing, and that's your real enemy, you're not really my enemy, you're just the tool of this. And the enemy is that hatred and those addictive mental states. Those are my real enemy. And so uh, the one thing, I will, I will die before I will allow that real enemy to take me over and make me a counter tool, so to speak. And then we'll just be destroying each other. Well, somebody will win or not win, but then the one who wins, the one who doesn't win will die, but will die in an angry way and wanting to be more powerful in the next life and more violent in the next life. And the one who wins will be more powerful than other people are going to get him or her or it. And then they, they diminish the quality of their life and they become more isolated and more shut off from others and more alienated and more paranoid and more aggressive a bit because they become more habituated to it. So that's the, the what's called the lojong, the mind transformation. And again, it's at a background where you have shifted your reality sense. Your reality sense is I'm not here to defend this meat. This, in a way, the, you know, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, my friend John Perry Bravo, he crazy guy, that was fun. He calls, uh, you know, they, those guys who are into virtual reality, you know, they call this meat space. What? You're in meat space. meat space. And then when you're in virtual reality, you're in mind space, you know, you're in like the electronic, you're like the matrix. And this is before the matrix, they had this thing. So in a way, the person who is doing, letting the other have a victory and so on, 
um, at in the deepest level is where someone really viscerally has begun to know that, and there and to them, death, life and death are just you know, death is just the way you improve the quality of life. You know, you just get let go of one coarse body and you get a better one, and you know how to do that, and you're confident you're going to do that, and you because you're not going to be driven by anger, hatred, lust, envy, uh, fear, are going to be driven into some hole, you know, in some bad state. Because you're, 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 you're able to detach from those energies, they can't take you over. And they actually you can even use them at a higher stage. But you can't you, pretend to use them if actually they do take you over, which the ordinary person they do. And uh, there, there are, you know, there are points where they just can't not do it, whatever it is. And um, so that's the background. You see, that background thing of Son of God is the key thing. That's the great mother thing. So sort of mindful that this is the great mother. That is really important. It's like this wonderful verse that I always love to recite from the King of Samadhi Sutra. It's Maharaja Sutra. Which says, who understands causality, cause and effect, which means relativity in a way. That person will definitely understand emptiness. And who understands emptiness, that person will become mindful of the most minute workings of things. So, you know, instead of like when you understand the absolute or emptiness, you know, the, the dualistic idea of the absolute, when you understand the absolute, like forget about it, it's just an illusion, who needs it? I don't have to worry about anything, I'm just in some vast other place. But actually, when you realize emptiness, you realize that everything is the relativity, and then within the relativity, a little better versus a little worse is a huge deal. And of course, a big better versus a big worse is also a huge deal. So then, in a situation of struggle and conflict, when you really are capable of the mind transformation, you're in what you're basically, what is called a saint. In Western ethical thinking, they call it ultra-obligatory ethics. Ethics of virtue, which is ultra obligatory. F. In other words, you're you're able to erase yourself in a situation. You're totally able to, and uh, then you have achieved what is called you have the transcendence of patience or tolerance. I never can decide which word is better today nowadays. In the old days, the word patience for the quote unquote moralists, you know, among the dead deadly sins and things, as a virtue, patience was the word. But, but uh, nowadays, I'm afraid patience somehow means that you're waiting, you're waiting to get your enemy later. <laughs> Rather than you're ready to bear whatever suffering without reaction. You know, so you think patience is, what, what is what a fool. Uh, how much we the more think of is tolerance. You, know? yeah. you tolerate, you have a high tolerance for whatever it is. Now, now there is a further thing though. And that is, uh, so that's when you're practicing something for yourself to develop your tolerance and patience and your ability to let the enemy have the victor, victory. But once you're able to do that, then uh, there's a question of judgment and responsibility in the situation. And if someone like is coming to kill you, and you would be able to let them do it rather than be angry with them. So not, even killing you will not make you, or torturing you will not make you angry with them. Might you make you really in pain, you know, pulling your teeth or something. But it's not going to, you're still going to feel there to some helpless poor tool of some, some crazy idea of, that they're getting something by torturing you. So you, so you, you were beyond that, you were beyond that reaction. But then it's very bad for another person to torture you. It's very bad for another person to kill you. So then you might actually evade the killing, you might stop them from killing. And in extreme case, you might, if you had to, you might, you, you know, someone who was about to press a button and kill like the, the insane leader of North Korea and kill everybody in Seoul by some bombs that his agents have planted there that he doesn't need a missile to carry there and he's just going to blow up the capital in a nuclear attack because somebody doesn't like his hair to blow up because they're going to actually bomb his nuclear young young reactor, which they should have done 30 years ago, actually. Somebody should have blown that up. But um, uh, save the poor North Korean people the misery that they've had <coughs> all this time. But, um, and you can only stop that person by shooting them. You can't just hold, bind their hands and take them out for you know, re-education. <laughs> but you have to even take their life. 
you do that. You should do that. At that time, if you're at that stage, you know, where then you're really caring for the other person, and it's not good for the enemy to harm you. But that's, but, and then the, my son hates it when I even mention that, because he thinks that people will then pretend to themselves, well, I'm fine, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hit back die. anyway. You know, yeah. I'm not really mad, but it hurts me more than it hurts you. You know, it's a slippery slope sort of thing. He, he doesn't like it. But, it is, but Buddhism is practical like that. And in particular, there's one particular thing, which is in relation to women, who are always abused, you know, since we're here in the, in the spirit of the Great Mother, you know, they, uh, in a way, need to be more aggressive without anger. That's the trick. So they think that if they don't use their, they need their anger to be aggressive, they think. But actually, when you're aggressive, fueled by anger, short of you're enlightened, and you're not necessarily enlightened, then your aggression will be less effective. Because there's all these studies, and the Buddhists long before the studies, they know when you're angry, your judgment is impaired, and you don't, you know, you don't, you're not strategic, and you maybe overdo, or you, over, you know, whatever, and you bring down more wrath upon yourself often, you know, and you miss your shot, you know, whatever it is, you know, you, you know, when you when you lose it, when you lose it, you're much less effective. So the key there is that. Um, uh, to intervene in situations that are going wrong, that's the Shantideva teaching. When you see something happening that you don't think should happen, when something that you should think should happen is prevented from happening, those are the two things that make you feel frustrated. Then if you internalize and, and nurse the frustration until it builds up, you then blow up and freak out. He, he, he analyzes it like that. So then he says the fuel of the anger, which is the, the fury, the hatred, the whatever, which is the real enemy, is that slowly increasing ball of frustration by things going wrong. He says, so therefore, do something about the situation before you get frustrated. If in, in case you can't do anything about it, your judgment tells you there's nothing you can do about it, it's going to happen, then don't get frustrated on top of that, on top of your helplessness, in other words. So he has this wonderful thing where if you can do something, why get frustrated? Why be unhappy? If you can't do anything, why be unhappy? Either way, don't be unhappy. <laughs> That's the key. You know? And then, if possible, intervene right away. And like women know that, you know, you know, they do. They they are trained, socialized, not to be, react aggressively and to in, and to accept, you know, things that are on the borderline of abusive from their brothers, from their fathers from male peers in schools and things. And they're socialized not to react in, in sort of knee-jerk quickly. And so they internalize this, this abuse and, and, um, and then get pushed around even more. So they think when they hear this thing about they give the victory to other, what? What, you're giving the victory to? to the, I'm going to pee the if that, you must pee? know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and uh, so they, uh, so they need to learn not to blow up. So then they'll be told, "Well, you need anger to do it." But actually, uh, if they if they intervene vigorously in situations before they get angry, when they're in a good humor, they'll be so much more effective, mm -hmm. and they will be they will forestall the thing. And that's the secret. That's that actually is the key. And, uh, and then, of course, when you, if you can't do anything about it, then, of course, you don't try to intervene. It's like the Buddhist theory of defense, which for years I thought there was no such thing. I used to tell people in dialogue, interreligious, you know, academic dialogues and other kinds of dialogues, that the Buddhists didn't even have a theory of a just war or just defense, but they do, actually. And uh, the just defense is if you can defend yourself effectively without necessarily destroying the aggressor, and then, but just push them back to where they can aggress on you, and then you kind of make a deal with them, then not to try again without over aggressing on them. Then you should defend yourself. I mean, I'm talking like a king in a country you know, or a leader in a country. If you cannot defend yourself, they are really much too powerful. Then you should surrender right away, because by fighting somewhat, like last ditch sort of thing, you're going to kill some of them, and then they are going to be much more violent in their domination. And so they have, they're pragmatic like that. 
So, so that's it. So that's that's the Santi Deva teaching adapted in my inner revolution. Uh, no, my infinite life book. I address this in great detail. It's like a commentary to Santi Deva, because you know, or normally when people teach Santi Deva to Westerners or moderners, you can even say not necessarily Western, but let's call them moderners. Then, since moderners don't think that they are anything other than their body and mind complex in this life, they don't really think they are something beyond death and at a visceral level. Then, Johnny Davis thing about I'd rather die than get filled with hate makes no sense to them. Because what are you going to do when you die? You're just going to just eradicate yourself. The idea that the dying is a transformation into something else and, the, and free of hatred. And free of addictive mentality, it, it's, a, it's a chance for a quantum leap, evolutionarily speaking, is something that's just too remote. So that's why I address that in that book very, very intensely. Infinite life. Yes, thank you. And uh, I don't know if any of you have looked at that book, but you might yes. enjoy it. Actually, I should make a, someone told me who does PR that I, they can't understand why I never made an you know, audio book. We have to make an audio book since yeah. the press didn't do that. That would be a good thing to do. Mm. Yeah. People could lie there, people who were sick could lie there. What's that go? People who were sick could lie there and bear it. She had a mean it would give them something, would teach them something. Yes. People are sick. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. Yes. We'll be listening yes. to you talking that I was way. thinking I was really sick last month and my all my theories were put to the test because I felt so awful. Where's the mother? <laughs> Where's the great mother? Where's the nirvana today? You know, like everything aching and coughing. Oh, terrible influenza. But you have to do that. You have to work on finding the point uh, because the somehow bearing, grinning and bearing, somehow is the source of recovery. The grinning part. <laughs> Any other question? We can do some names. There's all this uh, beautification going on. Or what, or, or what, what do you want to do? You can do something. Let's climb a shamanic tree. <laughs> oh. Or I, I know what I want to say. This connects, I think, a little bit to shamanism. Quantum, quantum world, 1926. The most materialistic reductionist scientists in Europe. Einstein was there, Niels Bohr, Heisenberg, all of the great quantum. And the lead quantum people said that they had reached a point where they could not find a particle. That they couldn't say what deep reality, that is actual reality, finally, was. That mathematical theory, that, in, that material observation, Physical observation could not reach into past this certain level of, of uh, magnification. And there are wave particle paradox, uncertainty principle, meaning that when you observe some super micro reaction, that your observation interferes with it. So the notion of there being an objective thing that you're measuring, that you're reading off of the objective thing, it for, uh, you know, it's fa failed. So that's what they said. But then they said, then never mind, take heart, don't be discouraged. We can work at the level where we have particles to work with. And, uh, and you know, bracketing the idea of the deep reality we don't know. And we can work at the particle level in a probability statistics, we can invent things, we have quantum computers, we can blow up the world, we can do all kinds of stuff. You know, at, the, at, a, at a coarser level, but at the, at the deepest level, and the idea of reductionism is that if you keep magnifying and magnifying and magnifying, you'll get down to the rock bottom, a place where you can sort of control reality by its primal base or something like that. And they said no to that. And then Einstein rebelled against that, and he led a lot of the quantum physicists into all these crazy things about, you know, like multiple realities and all, all kinds of things that are not empirically testable. And therefore, actually, are just theology, basically. And because uh, he, you know, his theism would let him let go of the idea that somehow um, God's mind and his mathematical mind connecting to God's mind could seize something 
that he could control you know, nature. You know. He, you know, he would control the Great Mother, let's say. I didn't want to acknowledge there was, could have been an impredicable and inconceivable and miraculous and uncontrollable energy there that it was reality itself, but you couldn't say what it was. So they discovered that. Buddha discovered that 2,600 years earlier, and the Buddhist tradition has been built on that. And then in the Kala Chakra, there's this most interesting thing that I never saw, but I, I, since then I found it in a few other sources that I didn't recognize. But there's this idea that a Buddha body has no atoms. So, and that's not saying that it's just mind. But we, since you, people are used to saying, well, mind is this so subtle thing where, where you know, there's no physical element to it. It's not different from the physical, mental, and material. Then, but then people tend to want to say, well, everything is mind. But actually, at that level, it's stupid to say that because mind is a concept that is supposed to be the opposite of matter. So if there's no matter, why there wouldn't be mind? It's, it's something that no word will capture, in other words. So it's non-dual mind and matter are non-dual, but it's not part of particulate matter. It's matter that's more like a thought. It's like a wave. It's like pure energy without any particles. And therefore, from the basis of that being such a, of having such a body and having an awareness from that thing, it's like what I said yesterday, where the elements and then the, the subtle sub-elemental realities of the moonlight, sunlight, dark light, and clear light, those four levels, below that level, that, those are the levels where the Buddha's body emanates. And that's why the Buddha and the Great Mother can do miracles. That's why they can master the elements, because they're, they're inside the elements in a certain way. But the elements are the coarse particulate level things. And they are actually goddesses from the point of view of the Great Mother or of the Tantra, you know, the Buddha. So, this, so I think that the indigenous shaman, the true master shaman, whatever they would theoretically say about it, I think they maybe, they they can get into their own subtlety of mind and that's from which they can do these things that are considered not ordinary. I never say supernatural. I think it's the wrong word. So it's a word conceding to the materialists. You can only say supernormal. <laughs> or non-ordinary. What? Or non-ordinary. Or, or non-ordinary. Yeah. But not, they, we should never say supernatural because nature is, the deepest level of nature is this non... You know, and then they, they have, you know, Queer action at a distance, you know, like strange things in the, you know, where some spin of some atom that's a million miles away from the other atom changes that one instantly, instantaneously, which should be against the normal law of causality and so on. But that's those the spooky action at a distance. That's what they call. If you if you do if you go to a level where mind and matter are non-different and it's super subtle and there's no material and actually you can make them, you build all the body with all the elements and everything out of that then that's, that's, that's an encouragement that we can learn to be aware at our, from our most subtle, central, central super subtle awareness. You know. And that's something really interesting. Kyle Tucker makes a big fuss about that. Unlike it's most, most uh, deepest kind of Buddhist science is related to the Kyle Tucker, I think. I'm, Time and space. I'm not sure what that format is supposed to be or what What's the that? program is. I'm not sure what the format, can you hear me? What format? Well, is there a format? Can of I, what? Of, of, this, of, this, of, this pro, of this class this afternoon? Oh, no, we're having a kind of discussion. Oh, okay, Why? okay. So I just write, because I, I don't know, because I haven't sat with you, with you all before I here. See. So at any rate, um, sometimes I have we give, Sometimes we lecture, let's say, or, and okay. sometimes uh, um, visa guides ceremony sort of meditation. Okay. At the moment, we're having discussion. I have a a, 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 a random musing or uh, item for discussion on the way up here. Uh, I hate microphones because I feel like I'm really loud and people can hear no, me no, anyway. No, no, no. Oh, you need it. Okay. So at any rate, I'll just say I close my eyes because I feel self-conscious. Um, there's a lot about with men, uh, you know, uh, in relation to women, and as opposed to women, I'll say, uh, a lot of talk about about. I'm just I don't want some body balls, okay, 
and how uh, men talk about how, well, you don't have balls, or, you know, women don't have balls, or the thing about women that's different from men is that they just don't, they don't know if you have balls. And I thought, well, women do have balls. Sure. They are up inside them. They're their ovaries, yeah. and that's where the eggs are. Yeah. And so, and, and, and in some sense, I don't want to say they're better then, okay? I'm okay. Uh, I'm not well, going to say do. they're better. Okay. I bet you do. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Well, they're protected, right? They're up inside our yes. body. Where with because they must be to be protected. Yes, it means they're working so in the order body. whatever to be the right temperature to you know. Yes, yes, yes. To, to be able yes. to 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 bring forth life in the way that we are uniquely able to. Uh, and then men's are, are descended, and they descend during uh, development inside the, 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 the uterus, in, 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 in utero, that's part of human development. And do we all, and I'm not, because I'm not a scientist, do we all start as, as women and, and perhaps with the addition of a different chromosome become men? But at any rate, if anyone wants to you know, respond to that or comment on that in, 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 in the science or in the mythology, of you know women and their eggs and their ovaries as um, as compared with balls. And I, I'm sorry that you weren't here because you were we were you were I heard you just make, kind of make a random remark in, in in passing in our conversation about men and their balls. So I was talking about women having balls in the form of ovaries. Okay. 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 okay, okay just putting that out there. Do you know my reaction? Thanks. My, I would like. Do you know the joke? about why so many sperms get, it takes so many sperms to find an egg and for one, you know, you know, did you ever hear that? No. You don't know the reason? No. Well, that's because none of them want to ever stop to ask for directions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You ever heard that? No, I haven't. Oh, you got that one. Yeah, you know, yeah, maybe yeah. the Mayan, Thing. you know, you know the, <clears throat> Mayan, the Mayan game, you know, with the ball toward the ancient Mayan, you know, try, and, try and get the ball He's through the... Mm -hmm. Like Mike, Michael Douglas. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm no world traveler, but I had the good fortune to go to Chichen Itza and, oh, yeah. and see the ball court, you know, yeah. and uh, wow, that's something like... Oh, you mean like the place where they played high lawyer or something like that? Yeah, I mean, you have to, like, it, 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 unbelievable, like, you have to get the you know, the, the ball through this unbelievable hoop and, and, no and hands. Without, what? Without using their hands. Yeah, without using your hands. And talk about offering the victory. <clears throat> the person who wins gets executed. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yes, well, I know it's customs. considered an honor. <laughs> I know that's, 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 that's the Spanish conquistador reconstruction of the native people, or was they executing people? But I don't agree with that. No, no, th this, th this, was, this was their the own culture. The executors were the Spanish. Uh, really? I, I, I think I, so. I, I, I'm not agreeing with that. I, I know some shamans of some of those people, and they don't agree to that depiction of their culture. That they were so execution happy or sacrifice happy, they don't agree with that, and uh, I think they have a right. They have a reason. You know, always the case in colonial conquest, they try to make the conquered culture something horrible, and that gives them their propaganda reason why they can take up the white man's burden. You know? And uh, but I don't want to go into that in detail. Right now, but I have a, a thing about it. Just don't want to mention that. I don't believe all that stuff. It was the local guy that Yeah, yeah. I think that all <laughs> cultures, every sort of tribe thing had a little bit of a thing like that in the past, and they also had it in the past, and they were more gentle, and therefore the Spanish were able, even though the Spanish who arrived in the Mexico and these places were, they were only like five foot two, basically mostly, they were very short. They were so strong, but they were wearing tin suits in hot weather, and they had turista. <laughs> they had diarrhea, and they were not feeling well, and yet they beat up all these huge people, uh, somehow, uh, who were so vicious that they were sacrificing people right and left. Well, it never rang true to me. If they were, you know, in order to have a culture where you're sacrificing human beings, you have to be very rough, because you have to drag these people to their death. All the time, that means you have to have super warrior, fierce people to do that. And then a bunch of little Spaniards sitting around because they had some tin suits and a couple of horses. Mm -hmm. And they liked to bow down and worship them. I don't think so. That's ridiculous. <laughs> they were actually more gentle. 
that's how why they were all killed. But anyway, that's another story. Okay. So what do we do about the ovaries? Ovaries are great, you know. You can't get, you know, kicked in the balls in the same way that the men do. It's very lucky. They're protected. So, but I don't know what's the point of, of that exactly, but it's Me nice to express it. It's very good. <laughs> okay. So uh, what else? Anything else? We could. Uh, we could do the heart sutra. We didn't do the heart sutra when we started. Oh sure. You want to do more heart sutra? Sure. Yeah. I was going to do more goddess dance, but we can do Heart Sutra. Heart Sutra is good. good. Maybe I can give you a little more commentary on Heart Sutra. Sure. That, we'll go back to that format. Or we can, or we can open tonight with the Heart Sutra. Yeah, that's, I think that's okay. better. Okay. All right. That's better. Because this is another old topic. Okay. But it's a very important topic because uh, the emptiness thing is so critical. You know, all of these things like the magical side, the compassion side, the miraculous side, even the ability to give the victory to the enemy in, your, in a mental way where you don't get pumped up on hatred and frustration, uh, all depends on changing our sense of the background, of the foundation, of where we are located. And if you begin to sort of experiment mentally with feeling like no matter what could possibly happen, everything would be all right. What would that be like? We associate that with saints, you know, people even in theism, even, even father theism. The real saint who feels sort of the oneness with the divine, either through Islam or Judaism or Christianity or the monotheistic forms of Hinduism, um, which are the ones that we mainly know. Uh, when they feel like that, it's like, you know, God willing, you know, inshallah, you know, they're ready. Islam means to surrender, actually. Islam doesn't mean to be a terrorist. Islam means to surrender. Surrender to the will of God, it means. And the idea of God being benevolent and compassionate, so it means surrender to compassion, actually. It's really intriguing. So, so those people did that were capable of doing that. Saintly people were capable of doing that. And the greatness of the Asia, and India particularly, and eventually later Tibet and Mongolia and China and other places, uh, Sri Lanka and so on, is that um, they, they got more and more into how the basic background is goodness, not evil. So that you don't want to live armed to the teeth, armored to the teeth, and armed to the teeth. You want to be open to discovering the goodness of reality. That's the key thing. And this is something you can be open to. Okay, I don't want to... Uh cover ground that's already been covered, but it was recently suggested to me um, at work that I, as a woman, should be especially concerned about Muslims and should support a ban on Muslim immigration because Muslims are so hard on women. And I said, well, uh, I haven't been treated badly by any Muslim, be it a man or a woman, and I want to take individuals as I find them, rather than judge an entire group of people based on for you. their traditions. Good for you. Okay, thank, thanks. But is this a predominant or is this a, a, a particularly persuasive argument at, the, at no. this time? Okay. No, the ban on the Muslim thing is very stupid. <laughs> Even George Bush. Oh is against it, you know, <laughs> you know and uh, you know, that, the, Trump didn't do a birth of a thing about George Bush. I'm sure he would have liked to if George Bush had, had been, maybe he can prove George Bush was born in Mexico or something, I don't know. But um, no, it's very stupid because obviously there's 1.5 billion people who are Muslims. If you study, what the, if you study the Muslim thing, the Muslims are just trying to be nice Abrahamic followers. They believe in the same God as the Christians do. They actually like, they believe Jesus was a great 
master. They don't think Jesus was God. They think that's a little exaggerated on the part of the Christian. <laughs> but they do think Jesus was every bit a great prophet. And they totally into the Jews and they and Jerusalem and um, the mountain there where the old temple of David was and where Jesus threw out the money changers um, and where now the dome of the mosque of the dome of the or the dome of the rock rock of the dome whatever it's called Alexa Mosque dome of the rock. is that's a big thing for the Muslims so there's really no reason for the the Christians have always had a trouble with the Muslims as they have always had with the Jews. Because, you know, the one, the Jews didn't agree, the rabbinic Jews didn't agree that Christ was the Messiah predicted in the, in the Jewish Bible. And then the Muslims came and then they rejected that Christ was the last prophet and they had another prophet. So the Christians have always felt squeezed in between. And actually, if you analyze the long-term uh, record of history, the Christians have been worse than the Muslims. And they're a little lower, they get a little lower grade, actually, even though Jesus taught compassion. And that's because Christian teaching was hijacked by the Roman Empire at some point, by right? Constantine. He, 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 he banned the, the multiple life view that had been the view of the Mediterranean as a whole during Christ's life. He made the crucifix into a big symbol of Christianity, which it had not been for 300 years. They did not worship. They believed in the risen Christ. They did not worship the, the screwed over Christ, <laughs> the executed Christ. To them in those days, it would have been like wearing an electric chair around your neck. You know, they didn't do that. And the Romans did that because that conveyed a subliminal image of the power of Rome, of course, because the Romans are the ones who put them on there, not the Jews. The Romans did. Then the Romans, however, blamed the Jews for having made Pilate do it, which is false, false history. He did not. Pilate was a rabid executor. He executed thousands of people. Anybody who thought he might stir up the rabble, he executed. He was actually removed by a later emperor, I forgot the name, uh, than the one who was uh, serving in Rome at the time that he was, he killed Christ. Uh, he was removed because he was executing too many people and it was making them too rested in the colony there, the Jewish colony of the Roman Empire. And um, so, so the, the point is that Islam, we have to deal with Islam. It's just something you just have to deal with. And it, luckily it's connected to, the, it, its good side is totally connected to all of the same things that are the good side of the other Abrahamics in Judaism and Christianity. And, um, and those things are connected to Buddhism and Hinduism and Confucianism, etc., Taoism. I mean, all and indigenous, shamanic, non-literary traditions. They're all interconnected. Because why? Because this is something that the human being, the reality, can can try to understand and does try to understand. The human being is a being that wants to be realistic about where they're living because they feel it's maybe not safe not to be realistic. So they have a drive to understand their world. And uh, these people came up with certain things. And, uh, and the, the theism basically tries to say that the, the highest power, it's also trying to say that the highest power in the universe is goodness. But what happens is high priests take a hold of it and political authorities. And then they try to usurp the role of the good God, the merciful Allah al-Rahim, as the Muslims would say, the compassionate God. They usurp that role and they say, well, we control whether God is going to be good to you, depending on whether you obey our orders and make offerings to our, you know, uh, congregation plate, you know, the, what is it, the gift plate, you know, whatever it is. And if you, and we're not going to let them be good to you if you don't do what we say, which is a perversion, actually, of the original message of the great teachers, including Muhammad. And by the way, Muhammad was a total protectorate of his women. His first wife protected him against uh, all kind of complicated social problems. He was born in as an orphan. And then later, once he was, you know, everything, all his teachings were collected by different wives. He had more wives because a lot of his colleagues were killed in the persecutions that they suffered for a long time. And um, so that, but then he defended himself. So there is a little, the people who do the who do the violent Islam have some kind of bases of, of texts that they use 
having to do with the equivalent of Constantine in the, in the Muslim world, the caliphs of Baghdad, particularly, and the caliphs of Damascus, who again perverted it a little bit, Muhammad's peace and love message, in order to enforce their authority. And then they hired high priests who, jurists, you know, who, who made them, you know, they gave them a big role, you know, and made again, usurping the compassion of the deity and saying, well, it's not available if you don't do what we say. So that, that's a problem not only in Islam, but also in Christianity. Look at these people. All the evangelicals in this country, they all voted for a guy who was totally immoral, dishonest, lies, they all, everyone knew that. Abusive. Completely, they voted for that, supposedly holding their noses, and they all being so all moralistic, because they thought they could do some things that they wanted to do and push their authority through the guy, right? So they all voted for him, in spite of all their moralistic thing about how this guy, that guy's so immoral. So, you know, the fanatics of whatever strike, we have a few Buddhist fanatics. And there's a couple in Burma and Sri Lanka nowadays. There's in case, the occasional Buddhist fanatic. And they're really in trouble too. But there's been less of them in history, actually, because they don't have an idea of the ultimate reality they sort of esoterically come and see the emptiness like the, the wisdom, transcendent wisdom goddess. So they sort of generate, they, they tend to go to the female. But actually emptiness itself is not really a person. So when they get up there, they're about to have a battle, and they go, charge for emptiness! <laughs> it's, like, it's like, no, the simple-minded troop wants to charge because daddy said so. Or, in a rare case, mommy said so. But the idea that emptiness said so, it's a little harder to appropriate that. So where are you going to go? How are you going to charge for emptiness? You know? So there have been a few less in history because of the idea that the absolute is this, and therefore recognition that the absolute is this relativity means that your absolute preoccupation has to be compassion for others. That sort of that's the general tendency, but but people understand it imperfectly, and they do stupid things in the name of Buddha too, but not as much, luckily. Bob, since you're in a little bit of a history mode today, yes, it might be interesting to give a history of women in Buddhism. Of what? We're kind of in a political we're kind of in a political arena this afternoon, yes. in a historic arena, and it might be interesting for people to hear the history of women in Buddhism. The, oh, yeah. the history of women's place in Buddhism? Well, we, you know, India was also a male chauvinist thing. And basically, it's not really rocket science. Women's lot in societies improved to the degree that mili militarism declines. Mm -hmm. It's as easy as that. When the society is highly militaristic and there's a tremendous amount of violence, then generally the males will dominate, and then their, then their PTSD, unrecognized PTSD, will carry over and they'll brutalize their families. So the militaristic Wilhelm Reich, uh, to go to a different non-historical psychologist, have any of you ever heard of Wilhelm Reich? So Wilhelm Reich has a wonderful book called, um, pamphlet actually, his, his great book was something called The Function of the Orgasm which he comes up with the theory of emotional and physical armoring as being interconnected, you know, trauma and, you know, they being interconnected to muscular structures of cutting off internal sensations in the body, you know, cutting off actually internal health in the body, caused by militarism. But at some point in his life, he wrote a pamphlet, I think when he was so disillusioned with the Russian Revolution and naturally the Nazi takeover in Germany in the 30s, he wrote this book called the emotional plague and the murder of Christ. And, um, and in that, uh, he talked about how the military posture and the military sort of you know, violence, you know, spanking, beating the children, etc. All of this all intricate, beating the women, it all totally interconnect. And, um, and, it, and, it, and it registers in the body of the person conditioned and acculturated in such a militaristic society. So that's the thing. And as I said, Buddhism is blamed by the later Brahmin, even the holy ones nowadays, for making India gentle and demilitarizing India and making them vulnerable. Tibet 
is blamed by some young Tibetans who are upset that they're, that they're being genocided by the Chinese after 60 years of the dog on the front carpet. Still going on. And uh, so they blame Buddhism. They say, we, 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 before that we were power. We had uh, our own army. You know, they you know, naively are thinking only about what happened. Where in a way that the demilitarized Tibet let the enemy have the victory. In a way. Not necessarily willingly. And there are some people who fought back for some time. Although the Dalai Lama never considered that was a good option uh, himself. And uh, he tried to discourage them, but he didn't succeed completely. And, um, and then Mongolia. The idea that the Mongolians, who are like everybody's boogeyman, Genghis Khan, you know, they, they swallowed uh, all of Eurasia, more or less. The biggest empire that Eurasia ever saw. Bigger, their land control was bigger than the British Empire the Mongolian one. Although they didn't do well going to sea like the British did, but they conquered the land. And yet they became peaceful and chewed up in the 20th century because of being demilitarized. And um, actually nomadic women in general, in nomadic societies, women are very powerful and they're physically powerful. The legend of the Amazons is very much connected to so you know, different people, folklorists and historians, they say it's connected to the, the experience by the Romans and the Greeks, etc., of nomadic women in nomadic societies, where they, because they are basically very strong, they know they deal with yaks and cattle, and, and the men kind of wander off and go trading for some vegetables, you know, and salt and things, and the women keep those big animals under control, you know. So they're really very, and actually, anthropologists were wrong. Tibetan women used to have these, nomadic women had these big headdresses, and then they had all these corals and turquoises and, and um, amber and all kinds of things on the headdresses. This jewelry, diamonds and rubies too. And uh, they, thought, they thought that was their dowry that they brought. You know. But actually it was not a dowry. It was their own bank account. <laughs> and when they came from their birth family, uh, they, you, know, and, you know, prosperous ones, normal ones. And most of them were prosperous, actually. There, there, was, there was not a lot of poverty in pre-invasion Tibet, actually. Not a great deal. There were some professional beggars on purpose, who Heinrich Harald, the German guy, couldn't hire because they, they lived more prosperous than beggars. They wouldn't work on his uh, irrigation projects, his uh, hydraulic projects. But um, uh, because the Tibetans liked to give, so they were living quite well as beggars. But anyway, um, the Chinese ancient chronicles of Han Dynasty refer to the Tibetan women, what they call the Jiang tribes, as being very frightening and fearsome. Because agricultural societies tend to be more oppressive of women than the nomadic ones. Because the nomadic, if the guys don't behave, they have their own money, they have the cows, they, get, they dish out the milk. The guy can get lost, go find another tent. You know? they're, like, they're like that a little bit. And, uh, so, so the history of Buddhism with women was that initially the monastic thing, Buddha was mainly concerned to get the men into the monastic movement because the men are the violent ones. That was his interaction. You know, in my Inner Revolution book I make the argument and I thought the Catholics would really like it but they didn't really go for it because they don't like it when you do something and you say we're really working together. They don't want to work together because they want to be exclusive. So they didn't really pick up on it, but basically I taught the insight that the counter in history to militarism, the professional nonviolent people, are the monastics in general. Sometimes you have monastics being co-opted into some military campaign like in the Crusades in the West, but basically the monastic thing was where you get men out of the armies and then they go in and they live very militantly because that's how they're acculturated. You know, they have rigid discipline and they meditate a long time, or they Christian they chant and they and they live very sparsely and supposedly in very strong discipline, you know, ethical rules. Obedience is a big thing in the Western one, it's not a big thing in the Buddhist one, but still being self-disciplined is. And um, so that's taking the military virtues and turning it around where you use it to conquer yourself rather than conquering other people. So in a way it's an interaction in the militaristic society. And over 1,500 years, the Indians became much more peaceful. And as they became much more peaceful, you had the equivalent of Masters and Johnson in the 4th century of the Common Era, approximately. About 
1,600 years before, before Cleveland or wherever they lived, you know, whatever clinic they had. You know. In other words, criticizing male poor sexuality and lovemaking, actually. You had that in India. Even though they had a lot of monastics and holy people, they also were much more open about pleasure and sexuality as they, as they became less violent. In other words, gradually, they became more open about such things. They had their Shakespeare around the same time in their 4th, 5th century. You know, they, um, uh, the, the, the ragas, you know, the Indian music, the poetics, I mean, their whole civilization became uh, more gentle. Women had a greater role. But it was still male dominated right to the bitter end. And the Muslim, but, but being more gentle, they were conquered by the Muslims. So then in the esoteric level in Buddhism, which the last 500 years of Indian Buddhism was very, very predominantly the esoteric, or had been esoteric in the first thousand years. But then if you say Buddhism basically in its heyday in India was 1500 years long, the last 500 years where the esoteric was super important. And the esoteric was where the goddess is very, very prominent. And the Prajnaparamita, actual woman, the idea that a woman can be just as enlightened as a man, which he said right at the beginning, but it was kind of buried by the guys who were the, mostly the monks, because the monks were the more important. Because the monks were the anti-military military, if you will, the anti-military spiritual militants. And, the, and as, a, as a social remedy, it made the country more peaceful and made the, made the, the war less war. In India, a tremendous prosperity. You know. Because when the budget of the country doesn't go to support armies, what does it go to? It supports artists, supports families, supports uh, learning, universities. 6,200 monasteries in Tibet when it was invaded. In Cistercian Europe, there was only 1,600 monasteries in the heaviest Christian monasticizing of Europe before the Reformation. And the Reformation, for all of its, for whatever good it did, also was very bad because, socially for the rest of the world, because it created industrialization and it created a place where the males had no other option than doing something in the world, and therefore they were ready to go and colonize and invade the world with population growth. Mm -hmm. Europe exploded with the Reformation, actually, and became much more aggressive around the world. When they, before that, had, you know, half the men in monasteries. They were more, they could have some little local fights between barons and dukes, but they, they were nowhere, no position at all to go conquer the world. So the countries that the Reformation was affected, especially Britain, uh, where did a lot of and, and extra conquering. Anyway, so, so, so that's the thing. So in the inner teaching of Buddhism, the goddess is very much there, and the yoga of learning to identify yourself with the goddess, which is the essence of the Vajrayana, the Tantrayana, is taught. And um, a lot of the gurus in the Siddha traditions, the Adha traditions, who were some of them ex monks, some of them stayed as monks actually, but their gurus were women sometimes, very often. Mostly they learned from women. About and the women could be uneducated, and it could be simple. They would they called them dakinis, you know, some kind of female spirits or something, embodied in human form. They had a, they, they were everywhere, kind of around. But in a way, you never saw the women, even in Tibet, you don't see the Dalai Lama was never a woman. But there were reincarnated lamas, females, but not as big a number. So it's all been imperfect up until now. We still. None of the Buddhist societies reached a truly partnership society, not yet. <clears throat> but we have a chance now. We do have a chance now. Um, the fifth great renaissance of Buddhism, according to a late professor friend of mine from Japan, who was very, very honored in Japan, gave a lecture in California in his 80s. And the, those who stayed awake through the lecture had a big shock at, toward the end. It was hard to stay awake with his over slowly, faltering, faltering English. But he said, uh, he gave the first four, uh, you know, the original advent of Buddha, then the rise of the Mahayana, the universal vehicle, the non-dualist, the emphasis on the non-dualist side of it. Then he had two things happening in China and Japan because he was frightened about Tantra himself as a Japanese. 
somehow as a he was a pure land person personally. You know, he was a little worried about tantra, which they are. And in China, Japan, East Asia, because of the women thing, actually. Uh, China more so than uh, Japan. Because the Chinese are more skilled with their women than the Japanese for some reason. And, um, but he said, the fifth great renaissance in Buddhism, if there is one, will happen in the U.S. Huh. And it will feed back into all the Asian Buddhist societies, in, eventually. And this, everybody woke up, all those Zen people were in the center, in the summer, the seminar, and the, and the sutras, the Zen center in Los Angeles. He, uh, he, everyone woke up with a shock. So somehow we're part of the final possible thing. Just as I believe that the planet is ready to reach a really high state, soon, peaceful high state, like the Dalai Lama believes that, I also believe. But in turn, you would, we just took a huge giant step backwards. So they're trying, you know, the boys are trying to take us a giant step backwards. And it all has to do with their fear of women. The whole thing. Get them back in the house, you know. Get them back under control. Where is it in the Turkey? They're making a new law that you, can, you can't go to the police if you're being beaten by your husband. It's different countries are passing rules like that. Well, it's, uh, that makes it even more important for us to cultivate a uh, relationship with the great feminine, right? Yeah. In this, in this, in this climate, it's, it's very, very important to understand all the different aspects of this power. Definitely. And, you know, you know as you're saying, um, that this wasn't fully comprehended even with some of the greatest thinkers that have been on the planet, which are the Buddhist philosophers, that this, this issue is not really, really... It's no, it's not on today. the political and economic level. Definitely. And um, Columbia University, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not there. They have all these things about how many people have tenure or whatever. Women are not well represented. Still, they try, but still not. And then it's back in the pipeline. And school goes back to school and grade school, where the teacher doesn't expect the girls to excel in math, you know, and therefore they don't. But I think that, you know, this is why it's important for us to divorce in some ways ourselves from the cultural norms and to not allow ourselves as women or as men who seek to be equal with women to be defined by the cultural norms. I think so. And that's why establishing this internal relationship with the Great Mother is so important. And and to heal our relationship with her is so important so that we can stand in it no matter what is happening externally. Right. It, you know, and you were, you were talking about, you know, the, you know, being able to die happy no matter how you are dying. And one of the ways that you can achieve that is by, you know, healing your relationship with that which is your deepest creative process and that is inhabited by the great mother and you know that if you if you are looking at death as a transformation as a creative process being aligned with those creative processes as you're dying independent of anything that's happening around you or independent of anyone's you know uh, it, uh, independent of anyone's ability to try to use a, a negative intention to break your connection with this deep internal creative process is is uh, you know it, it's it's not possible to do it. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, I think that I think as women, you know, we, you know, this afternoon is really a discussion of you know political and historical views of women and women's place in society based on where men's functions and attention is. I think that the, the lesson for, for, for me, I think, is to uh, really step outside of letting anyone or anything outside of yourself define your relationship with your you know, femininity and with your relationship with the Great Mother. And, you know, in the, in the class that I teach called um, Tracking Spirit in the Birth Environment, Basically, what I'm doing there is I'm trying to help women connect with the Great Mother so that no matter what is going on, no matter what kind of medical intervention or 
uh, that may or may not be necessary or whatever kind of uh, problem that might arise with the child or a problem that might arise with the, the actors in the birthing theater, that they have that internal anchor, that internal strength within them in the, through their relationship with the Great Mother to kind of help bring them through it. And I think mm -hmm. that this is something that we can all do on a more general, general level as well. And to, you know, it doesn't matter what, you know, it doesn't matter what, how anyone's treating their women. It doesn't matter how anyone's, you know, how they're thinking about their women. If you have your own connection, you don't have to act within those norms. And, um, you know, especially here in the United States, as many problems as we have right now, women can find an independent way of being here. And it is, and survive. You know, in many cultures, women would be exiled if they didn't conform, and they would not survive. But women can survive here. And, and I think that they, you know, and, and thrive through this relationship with the Great Mother. So, and with their deeper femininity that, that she embodies and shows and demonstrates. So I think that I, you know when you're saying that in Buddhism there's you know this idea that the you know the, the big change that's going to come in Buddhism is in the West. I, I do think it is based on bringing women into greater equality within their yeah. Buddhist structures. And, yeah, sure. And I mean you see, and I, I you know I, I, you see that a lot of places are struggling to find you know, strong women teachers in Buddhist situations. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's our task to, you know, become that strong woman and who understands all of the principles of nonviolence and all of the, uh, has digested all of the lessons on, on the nature of emptiness and the Prajnaparamita and that intense creativity that lies within mm -hmm. it so that we can, you know, step into that, into that void and, and, and hold it in a, in a way that allows other people to also step into it. And, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a thought. I no, couldn't agree more. Yeah. I do want to say, though, that one thing, as far as Buddhism goes, is to, this is maybe intra-Buddhist thing, but the idea that, um, you know, this, this Trump business that just happened now, um, and the number of people who were conned by him or who he drew in with his misogyny among, as one of his major you know, misogyny and xenophobia and stirring up all kind of resentments and hatred in males and even in women who identify with their males and in, um, and, uh, in the sort of right whatever. Um, it shows us that there is still a role for the monastic. And you know, like the Zen people, who are like I'm a Zen monk, and they have a girlfriend and a wife, and it's just ridiculous, you know. It, and and the idea that because the Protestant thing is against monastics, that the that the culture of conditioning is against monastics, and the Catholic thing is sort of, you know, just it's it's become kind of politically better known and powerful since the day when Kennedy and people freaked out we couldn't have a Catholic president. And now the Catholics are Supreme Court justices and et cetera, so they're quite strong in the society. But they themselves are not pushing really very much their monasticism. And we can see that we're still hugely militaristic, you know, $54 billion more dollars to the $600 billion military, and that doesn't even measure the huge expense and the huge focus on militarism. So, you know, those leaders of Buddhism who are all ex-monks, such as myself, um, they all get into how we don't need monks, our new Buddhism will be no monks, etc. And I think that's, uh, that's not correct. Monks and nuns, and the nun thing should be very, like two thin children and Pema children, the two children with the two nunneries that they have going in, in Nova Scotia and in Washington State. They need a lot more support, there should be lots of nunneries so women have a, have a um, way of not having to be like slave of the family. And, and see it as a spiritual path and so forth. So, um, so this sort of new Buddhist thing might take a little longer than just you know the next election. You know. But um, you know, 
But yet what you're saying, I completely agree with that. And how could that be connected to the movement to try to put together the representation of the people against the wealthy, against the oligarchs? How could this be done? It's very hard to see, actually. Well, I think, you know? I think if we can return to our own native ways of knowing our own creative power, I think if you have a lot of people that are empowered in this way, I think that that changed Well, yes, I, I agree. You know? But, but uh, what institution or how are you going to have such a lot of people? That's the question. We're going to do a lot of teaching. Yeah, that has to happen, yeah. But Bob, do you see this as a sort of huge women's movement? What's that? Do you see this as a huge women's movement that's sort of military? What do you see? Well, no, I think that, well, no. I mean, Foxcroft was the first thing. Yes, it should be more military, maybe, I think, you know, but this huge so-called, the fact that the Washington thing happened and was called a women's march, you know, although there were a lot of men marching too. Uh, it's good, I think. That's really good. And, but then the question is how to sustain that, how to connect it to a spiritual thing, you know, how to, how to deal with the, the evangelicals, for example, which is that 25% group that supported this nasty thing. But basically, there are a lot of them, there are nice evangelicals who, for example, they think it's a sin to destroy God's earth. You know, within their own Christian doctrine, they are. And, but somehow, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not mobilized, you know, and then there's the abortion issue and the whole thing, and the pro-life, suppose, all those, I love the joke where someone said they're pro-life until they've given birth, and then after that you're on your own without insurance. <laughs> and, uh, or support of any kind. And, uh, you know, so there must be a better way of dealing with these things to remove these wedge issues that are used to remove the spiritual people or the people who are, have some religious faith from from the movement to have a sane, caring society, you know, compassionate and caring society. I mean, you know, I read this um, Matthew Fox, who I like very much, you know, who is a very nice Catholic, who was uh, condemned by the bad popes that we had recently, like Benedict and other people, but maybe even by John Paul, he was condemned. I forget who was the one who banned him, kind of, Matthew Fox. But he's great. He wrote a letter to Trump, I think, or somebody at some point, and he said, you know, did, what is it about Jesus saying that you should care for the poor and the oligarch has as much chance of going to heaven as a camel through the eye of a deal? How come you guys are missing those sentences, you know, those passages in your own scriptures? What is your problem that you're blind to them? You know? he, 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 he puts it very well, Matthew Farr. So, so how to sustain that great woman's march? You know, I was down with Marianne Williamson with her sister giant thing. She had five, six thousand people involved in that, both online and at the event. And it was moving and very strong energy there, no question. And um, they allowed a few males like me to say something. <laughs> Come and say something. And the nice Reverend Barber in North Carolina, who is head of the NAACP in North Carolina, has been dealing with this. Those are absolute um, Neanderthals who, you know, were freaked that Roy Cooper won. That Democrat won the governorship, by the way. He's trying to function there with his bad legislators that are all put in by the Koch brothers. The dark money created these Republican states that don't even count votes and suppress votes, and that's, which is what another reason that he won. Another reason that 16 people ran for office. Why did 16 Republicans run for office? Because they knew they did have a green. So they knew if they could win the primary, they have a very good chance against whoever, because of the 28 Republican-dominated states. Out of 99 state legislatures, the Republicans control 58. Completely, 100% control. Of course, they're strong in others, but they control completely. Yes, I know, we're going to stop now. So now we need to, by your leave, you can stay if you wish. We're going to do a interview. Um, Isa is going to interview, and stop a little early, and she's going to interview me about the man of peace over there. Oh, good. The Dalai Lama. And uh, we're going to do that, when, and, and Justin is going to um, aim the camera. We might um, do that at the beginning of the evening, because we only have five minutes before, um, or ten minutes before dinner, sir. No, we're doing now. No, we're now. doing now. I, we're doing now, <laughs> so we don't mess up the evening. <laughs> and we're just, it's only 10, 15 minutes. 
and uh, we'll go a little late to dinner. People can <laughs> stay or go, whatever they like. Okay? But we have to move again. The it's light the is no good here. Behind it. It's the best time. The back light is Relocate. no good. Relocate. Don't you think? Is that doable? No. no. I, I disagree. We can get, if I bring the camera up closer, I can get it really, get it really then well. Then do it. 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 Okay. This video was brought to you in part with the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit Tibet House U.S., including invites to special trips to study Buddhism up close and personal with Robert Thurman during his annual geographic expedition trips. Trips in 2018 include Mongolia and Bhutan. To learn more, visit BobThurman.com.